Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hello, welcome back. This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got one of my favorite individuals back on the show, the gymnastics doctor, Nick Sorrell. Nick is the head of Brute Gymnastics, as well as an ear, nose, and throat doctor in Louisiana. Nick is one of my favorite people to talk to because he is such a deep thinker, and he is a very values-driven person. He's constantly looking at the decisions he makes and the behaviors in his life and putting them through the filter of, does this align with my deepest values? And so in the beginning of this show, you'll hear us uh, talk a lot about kind of the meaning of life and um, how taking more responsibility in your life leads to uh, a better experience. We talk about what to do as your goals change, how to maintain your level of fitness and and how we've both done that over the course of time. And then I ask him uh, a handful of questions out of the Tim Ferriss book, Tools of Titans, uh, a series of questions that are meant to dissect physical disciplines. And so obviously we dive into some gymnastics, namely the muscle up and handstand push up. And so we talk about things like what are the key concepts that novices should know? Uh, I ask him if you only had six months to train me to get a muscle up exactly how would you train me, uh, as well as if I could do 15 muscle-ups, how would you train me to get 20, and so on. The gymnastics doctor is always a wealth of knowledge, and I know you guys will love this show because you always uh, you always tell me so. So without further ado, the gymnastics doctor, Nick Sorrell. The gymnastics doctor, Nick Sorrell. I am blessed to be in your presence, sir. <laughs> yes, Welcome back are. to the show. Yeah, absolutely, man. Awesome to be back. <laughs> man, let's uh let's start here. A couple years ago, you went through a bit of a uh, I don't know if it, I would call it transformation, but you went through a a change in your personal fitness. Mm-hmm. Um where you really you were experiencing some things that you didn't like in your health and your fitness level and you really reengaged in terms of nutrition, in terms of injury prevention. Tell, tell us the story. What what was happening? Uh, yeah, so that was, yeah, I guess about a year and a half or a little more ago. And um, we were in our brute camp in, when was it that we uh, we went to? I think it was the Utah one. And uh, I was, every time I remember getting up and trying to demonstrate something or something like that, I just felt terrible, right? And we had also recently uh, filmed a bunch of stuff for the Brute Gymnastics program. And I remember I had to get you and Matt and Derek and everybody to keep, you know, d- doing stuff because my body just couldn't handle it. And I just kind of pushed off to the side. I was like, well, I'm getting older, et cetera. And then we were at, when we were at that camp, you know, I remember everybody giving lectures, including you and Sean and, and Adi and everybody. And I'm like, rah, 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 this is awesome. You know, you were the talking about how, uh, the mentality of health and fitness and, um, and all that stuff. And I was like the biggest cheerleader for all of it. And then I kind of looked down at my body and was like, I am really overweight and, uh, everything in my body hurts whenever I jump up and just try to grab the bar of the rings. So I said, this is, uh, this is bull crap. You know, I'm not practicing what I preach. Mm-hmm. So when I got home, I basically called a D, uh, and Sean, uh, you know, Sean with Active Life and Adi, your wife with WAG. I was like, can y'all help me out? And uh, I was really blessed to have such good people in my life because, uh, you know, Adi hooked me up with um, somebody to help me with uh, my diet. And Sean hooked me up with a program that would assess some of my, uh, you know, my injuries. Because I remember something that Sean talks about is we tend to identify with ourselves at with identify ourselves with our injuries. And I was like, yeah, I'm the guy with the bad shoulder. Right. And then, you know, reached out to Sean and he was like, no, you know, this is something we can do about it. You don't have to be your injury. And so that went through a process of about six months of par- prioritizing that, you know, cause I got into the point where that was not a priority and I just had declined in my own personal fitness. I wasn't feeling good. And I felt like I was kind of just, um, 
treading water or just surviving and not thriving, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And after just being intentional about that and following those things, as well as, uh, you know, just training, like the training the right way, you know, kind of like I've learned from a lot of my colleagues in Brute and, uh, and I just got to where I just felt great. All the, you know, I lost a ton of weight. I lost 20 pounds. Um, I hit PRs like crazy. Like to me, a bucket list thing was always to be able to clean 315. Next thing I know, I just did it. And I Mm -hmm. was like, how the hell did this happen? And it was because I finally started to diet correctly and exercise correctly and do all the things I'd been preaching all these years. That's awesome, man. I think there's something... There's something interesting about being so involved in a certain discipline and coaching or leading in that discipline that like, I think a lot of people go through something similar as you, I, I certainly did. Like once you start teaching something, I think it's easy to take it for granted. Yeah. And for years being more involved in health and fitness from a leadership and teacher perspective or instructor perspective made me more engaged with it. But over time, I started to take it for granted and kind of tell my sto- myself this story that I don't need to pay as much attention to it. Mm-hmm. And like I was so up close to it that I didn't notice how my body was changing or that I wasn't working out enough. And I went through exactly the same type of thing. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, one one thing that also is compounds that is, you know, in the fitness world, we can have a um an outlet in that we can live vicariously through our athletes right so like mm-hmm. i would see all my athletes making all these strength gains and all this stuff as a part of this philosophy that i'm building and so like and that gives me that sense of well-being seeing them do well but then as time goes on if i'm putting all of that on the the athletes and getting all that then my then all of a sudden and i'm not paying attention to myself and i'm letting them you know, reaping all those gains vicariously through them, then I suffer for it. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. That's a very interesting perspective. I think as human beings, we are in constant search of little dopamine hits, yeah. whether that be through caffeine, through ad, um, like acceptance from other people, through seeing our athletes get hit PRs themselves. Yeah. We're constantly looking for dopamine hits. And what often gives us those those hits and and keeps us motivated and Uh, keeps us feeling alive is just feeling fit ourselves. But that's, that's an interesting perspective that if you're, if you're getting those needs met, uh, through other people, then you could be telling yourself, um, send your, sending yourself, uh, uh, the message that you, you really don't want. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. I think about that a lot too. My wife and I, we, uh, our, our little quote that we like to say is, uh, life is more than a series of whims. You know, so, Mm -hmm. and that's that dopamine hit thing, you know, and I've seen that a bunch of books. I remember, I think, uh, Taleb talks about that in Black Swan and, and, and you see it all over now, but, and people are becoming very cognizant of that, you know, and that's that whole emotion versus reason thing. Like if I can fulfill my daily emotions and saying I'm fulfilled in the moment, it's like the picking up your phone, right? That's the biggest thing that, or one of the biggest things we struggle with in this era is you get that little dopamine surge every time you pick up your phone. But if you really sat there and you thought about it and you like, is this really doing anything? This little, this action that I'm taking, mm-hmm. is this doing anything to move me towards something that is going to be true fulfillment for me? You know, right. and and so actually, I started thinking about that too. And and this is a part of that whole process is just doing that with my fitness has made me attuned to those other things. So now I, I try to cognitively, anytime before I take out my phone, I say, why am I taking out my phone? Like I will mentally tell myself, is there a particular reason, or am I doing it? because it's controlling me because I need it or I'm addicted. Mm -hmm. And actually, and I remember you, the last time we were uh, were in Austin at our Austin camp and you were on your not eating sugar for a year thing. What was that Mm -hmm. it? And and I said, why are you doing that? And you're, and you're just very plainly say, cause I want to prove that nothing can, nothing can control me. Right. And I think that's a good exercise and it doesn't have to be any particular thing, sugar, it can be whatever, it can, but that you go and you prove to yourself that this thing doesn't have control over me because I'm the master of my own emotions. Right. Dude, I'm, I'm so big on the technology piece. Have you, do you know Cal Newport who wrote, he, uh, he wrote deep work? Uh, I've heard of deep work, uh, but I don't recognize that guy's name and I haven't read the piece. He, that one's phenomenal. He also wrote digital minimalism, which just came out and he talks all about 
the the basically the fact like the whole book starts out of talking about how there are billions of dollars spent by tech companies such as Facebook and Apple and Google on making phones more addictive because right. they're all in the uh, attention game. If they can get more of your attention, then they can sell more ad space. And so it's not surprising that these things are just incredibly addictive and we pick it up something like, I don't know, maybe 86 times a day i think we pick our phones up on average i, I heard the statistic was four hours a day that people spend well, four hours. right but i'm just talking about a pickup the, the time right? but yeah it's like yeah. hours each right. day and and for younger kids it's uh as high, i've heard as high as nine and that's an average that's unreal. for a certain population that's unreal like just not even looking at the world around you that's crazy so if anything you've just gotten busier now Yes. Now, what, where are you at with your your fitness and maintaining all of what you worked so hard for? Yeah, man. So, um, I, I yeah, I got to where, and, and it's a good. It's funny because if you look at it from outside looking in, you may say it's a bad thing. Like because essentially now I haven't been tracking in months. Like I've been tracking what I eat and I've been working out as much. So outside looking in, you'd be like, oh, you know, we kind of fell off the cliff, right? But really, it was more of a, a matter of reprioritizing. Like I had to spend those hours and those reps, so to speak, on getting myself where I needed to be mentally and physically. And now though, you know, as life has a habit of doing, it it shifts, right? And um, I, you know, for my, my day job, I'm a ear, nose and throat doctor. And I um, had moved to a new office about a year and a half ago. And we had our baby. And that, so it was all a bunch of things, uh, our second baby. And it was kind of a bunch of those things that had precipitated the decline, like all the stress in life. But then now, and then I, at that time I had the time because I had just started the new clinic. Um, you know, I guess, you know, maybe not quite as many needs, um, that, that had to be met in other areas of my life. I had the time to focus on the health and the fitness. And now it's gotten to the point to where, with my ear, nose, and throat gig, uh, I'm opening a new clinic, and I have all these different things pull me that direction. Um, you know, my uh, girls are getting older, and they're getting in more little activities. And so now I'm, I'm shifting that focus back on those things. So the amount of time that I'm putting in is going towards them. But then it comes back to the, has that meet, made the other stuff decline? And in my opinion, no. Actually, and if you look at the numbers, I, I still weigh the exact same amount as I got mm -hmm. down to which for me is like 175. That's kind of my fighting weight. You know, I was up to 192 before I started losing the weight. Um, and uh, I, I just did the 19.1 gain uh, CrossFit thing. And even though I'm only working out one or two days a week, I tied my score from 2016, you know, so like I still feel fit and I feel as good as I want to feel right now. Right. Um, and, and I need to for this point in my life. And it's just, and I don't really have the interest in, in being competitive in fitness right now for me personally. But as far as my goals right now, I'm meeting my personal fitness goals. I've just shifted the amount of time that I'm spending on it to, to fulfill the other things that are more pressing for me right now. So I've, th this really resonates with me because I've for so long told myself that I could play at a very, very high level at every single area of my life. And I'm starting to understand that there has to be trade-offs if I'm going to be yes. really good at, or if I'm going to invest a significant amount of time into anything. And this guy, James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits, um, he, he wrote a blog post recently that he called the four, and he talked about this thing called the four, the four burners effect. Uh, the four burners are our family life, our social life, our health, and our career. He says you can be good at three, excellent at two, and world-class at one, mm -hmm. but you can't be world-class at all of them. Yeah. And that, you know, that really hit home for me because I was trying to be world-class at all of them. And obviously I'm not, <laughs> uh, <laughs> obviously I'm not. But I, t I told myself that I could be if I just figured out the, the perfect system for right. it. But his whole, his whole thing is about like get clear about what you actually value most in your life. And then if you're going to choose two things, right, say career and family, which it sounds like that's what you're focused on right now, 
what systems can you put in place for the others to at least maintain them? Yeah. Because you don't want to, you don't want to let the light go completely out on that burner, right. but you just want to maintain it at a, a low level while you go all in on, you know, one or two things. Yeah, man, that's so, dude, it's so interesting that you said that it's that common human experience thing because that without reading, I didn't read that book and that's exactly what I've been thinking on my own lately, you know, so basically family and career, exactly like you said, um, has been really important to me right now, but then I've got, you know, also the brute thing, right. And my fitness thing, which are, you know, which are probably the other two biggest things for me. Um, and, um, I've been working on ways that I can do that. So, you know, Derek, the other gymnastics guy and I, we find a time early in the morning, waking up early in the morning to go and meet and work on uh, that stuff, uh, you know, once a week or a couple of times a week to uh, fulfill that obligation. And then I just, the, the other thing is, is working out. I try to do it when I can, but I've learned that I had to create a system. And like you said, and for me, that system was essentially waking up earlier. So mm -hmm. I had to mm -hmm. decide for myself, um, and I actually got this from a wag post. I read that book, Perfect Day Formula, which was a pretty good book yep. uh, in terms of like being a, a rally call for that sort of thing. It's all stuff that you kind of know, but but you read it and it's like that motivation to do it, to actually enact it. And I got to where I started waking up earlier and, uh, you know, and trying to fulfill those goals through that, like creating, like you said, a system to, uh, to keep those other things going. Guys, you can actually get a free copy of the perfect day formula. If you Google brute strength, perfect day formula, uh, I did a blog post with Craig, or I did a podcast with Craig Ballantyne years ago, and he give, he's been giving away free books to everyone that is interested. Um, where were we? Uh, I don't know, man. We haven't talked about any gymnastics or whatever, but um, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> so I got lots Doc, of other things in the noggin, though, man. You you have so many incredible traits about you, <laughs> but sure. there 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 are two that really have always stuck out to me that uh, I want to dive into. One is your methodical way of dissecting problems. Uh, you've turned in, I don't know, like. 80 page spreadsheets at brute before <laughs> more, pretty much <laughs> possibly more spreadsheeting um, is my spiritual gift yes. you're very you're very organized methodical in the way that you um, look at problems and the way you present things and you're also one of the most principled men that i know and you're always putting the decisions that you make in life through the filter of is this in line with my values where do both of those things come from Oh man. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's, uh, I mean, two things that are very, uh, um, uh, complimentary, I guess, in terms of what people think about you. So thank you. But, um, I, I honestly, I, I think I, I will always probably put first, you know, when, per, when people will pose, uh, uh, you know, or, or say something about my values and, and my accomplishments that, that, that I was the benefactor of really good mentors. Right. And, uh, of, you know, first starting with my family and then, you know, other people in the educational system and then being really lucky to have good friends. Right. You know, friends that are going in all, you know, not with a bunch of knuckleheads that don't have any goals or aspirations in life, you know, and you kind of all move forward. You know, for me, I always say when my family was my family is very loving and caring family in terms of you can do whatever you want. And if I was flipping burgers, they'd be proud of me. But for me, it was that you know, not being successful was never an option, you know? Um, and so I guess that's just to say the value started at home, right? Mm -hmm. And they started at home and then they grew as, you know, and then just to talk about the friend piece again, I've, a lot of my values have been, you know, um, molded just through even this late in life through meeting some of you guys, right. And, and seeing the kind of, um, ways that your filters, like in the things that you run through and, and cause we're always tinkering with them and, always envision it that we have like this tier of things, you know, I grew up in a Christian home and that's a set of values, you know, and whether you're Christian or not, we all need a set of values to say what right or wrong is because you can't find right or wrong under a microscope or in a test tube. Right. Um, and so it's important for you to work out your own philosophy, but I had, you know, that philosophy as a baseline for me. Um, and then everything else is built. So you have these things like don't steal, don't cheat, be, you know, honest, be kind, um, and, uh, and those things are the main 
catch all. Like you, you, everything goes through that filter first, right? And then everything else is is kind of smaller filters um, that you know be successful, but not at. The, but then you know that being successful doesn't come at the expense of doing something that is your core philosophy, right? Like I'm not mm-hmm. going to be successful at the expense of being unkind, right. you know, or, um, and, uh, and so that's grown over time. But like I said, fortunately, I, uh, I think I had a very strong foundation. If you have a strong foundation, then you can figure the other stuff out as you go. And, uh, again, that's been through other life experiences, including education and wonderful friends. Um, and then, uh, as far as the organization and everything like that, I think that was just a product of that. Like, I, to me, being a successful person, you know, was something that I just wanted to do. And, and you know, you now that's a big asterisk on that because how do you define success? I don't think you define success by the amount of money I make or the stuff that I have. But to me, it's wanted to be kind of the author of my own destiny uh, and say that if I want to give my family this opportunity, I'm going to do it. If I want to create or say, for instance, with the the brute thing, if I want to create a program or do something that has an impact on other people, to me, that's successful. Like the money is, wasn't as important for all that. Right. Or with my, unfortunately my jobs, you know, both with brute and with, uh, you know, being a doctor are good conduits for that. Cause I can define success by my outcomes with my patients. If I have a bunch mm-hmm. of people that are coming in, high five me, tell me they have a better quality of life, then I don't care what the paycheck says. Um, you know, and then as the, as time has gone on, I've tried to re-solidify. So, and then when having kids, there, there's all these things were more of a vague thing in my head, right? Like be a good person and mm-hmm. filter that through Christian values. And as I've gotten older though, or have I've had kids specifically, then you got to say, well, how do I distill that down into something that's palatable for my children, right? And um, so I've read a lot about uh, virtues and not say a lot about it. I'm not as good of a reader as you, but, uh, you know, just kind of your cursory knowledge of what other people say about that. And and I've kind of distilled it down to four things for me that I want to instill in my kids. And this is going to evolve over time. But those four virtues are be kind, um, then uh, and then kind of in this order. You know, uh, be kind is the first one. So my daughters are three and two and a half. And that's what we work on. You can filter everything right now through kindness. Like, are you? and my daughters will say it. And that's like really touching to me. Like my older one will be like, uh, tell the little one, Nora, that's not kind, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, and so, but you can teach that and you can filter every lesson through that, right? Like if you're not listening, you're not being respectful and that's not kind, you know? And, and you can filter a lot of things through that. And as they get older, I want to uh, teach them strength. You know, and then so every you can teach, you know, um, uh, you know, self-reliance and mm-hmm. uh, all these other things uh, through the filter and the virtue of strength that, you know, leads to being courageous and all these other things that go into that big umbrella of strength. And then, of course, and then the third one would be um, humility, you know, and then as you get older, if you develop these virtues, you can't let that make you think too much of yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. But that's a little bit of a harder concept to learn. You know, for me, I was not very humble. Uh, and I, and I've heard the phrase before, if you think you're humble, you're not humble. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm probably, I, I still have, obviously I'm going to have a long ways to go with humble, but I can look back on my former self and be like, that guy was not humble. Like that guy mm-hmm. was, and I'm still have a long ways to go, but I wish I could go back and shake my former self and, you know, right. and back when I was in high school and college and be like, you do not have it all figured out. Right. Uh, and then the last one of the four would be uh, wisdom. Cause that's something that has to be cultivated, you know, obviously with a long time. So, um, but yeah, man, we're all looking for that. We're all looking for a way to make this life make sense and find, um, purpose and, and value in it. And something not that, not that gives you that, that dopamine hit, mm-hmm. but something that gives you that baseline sense of well being, right? Like my, my sense of well being by having these systems in place, as you mentioned, that I can filter things through that makes things make sense to me. Um, and by knowing that I'm being, I'm living a good life by filtering everything through those values gives me mm-hmm. that baseline sense of well being, not that just day to day whims and, and everything like that. So right. it's a very rambling, uh, or very long winded answer, I guess, but oh, that's great. That's exactly what I was looking for, man. Uh, I want, I want to share this with you. I'm not, are you familiar with Jordan Peterson? 
the psychologist? Yes, dude. I, so it's the podcast I was just on, Mind Muscle Project. Shout uh-huh. out to them. They asked me if I could interview one person, and I didn't. I wasn't prepared for the question, and yeah. I actually said him. And I was like, "This will be a very polarizing answer." Because, exactly, exactly. Because because there's people that hate him, right? Uh, Absolutely. There's people that hate him, him. but he, but and, and like it, you can disagree with him or not, and. But he is a very ra- he has a very rational way of presenting himself. He's the most he, logical person he, he's, I've he's, ever heard. Yeah, he's extremely logical. He doesn't let emotion get involved in it, and mm-hmm. he just speaks practically and and philosophically, essentially. You know, and philosoph- philosophy is always a debate. You mm-hmm. know, um, and uh, it's like the um, what was that thing I heard on Art of Manliness a while back? It was they do it's this group where they go in and they read all the great books, and they call it the Great Conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's fascinating to me, how all these values that we have in us as people, we kind of take for granted as if they're innate. But if you'd have dropped us hundreds and hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, the way we process information would have been a completely different, right? Because the environment Absolutely. that we're brought up in has been shaped by this great conversation that's been had by, you know, Augusta de Hippo or, or well, I'm saying their names wrong because I'm woefully ignorant and all these things. Uh, I, I, but I'm fascinated by philosophy. I wish I had more time to delve into it. But and that's but that but that's a I'm, I'm stealing your uh, your question here. But that guy Jordan Peterson, to me, that's what's fascinating about him. He's like a modern day guy like that. That's shaping the way that we think about it, it's shaping this great conversation. Right. Anyway, but yeah. But what were you going to say? Yeah, about, what were you going to say t- about him? <laughs> I'm glad you're turned on to him, man. And he is polarizing and. Uh, it's totally understanding. It, it's totally understandable why. However, I saw him speak live in San Antonio, and so he has his book Twelve Rules of Life," which yeah. was which has been one of the most popular books of this decade. It was on the Amazon bestseller list for something stupid like like thirty eight weeks, like longer than just about anything. Right. And the, his his presentation was about the thirteenth rule for life. Because in his original, uh, I think he started the rules for life on a Quora um, forum at at one point. And he wrote out like 50 of them. And he just put the best 12 in the book. But his 13th is that uh, opportunity lies where responsibility is abjugated. So where people are are not taking responsibility Mm -hmm. in the world, that's where the most opportunity lies. Right. And so he has this big thing about the the degree to which you will find life meaningful is directly correlated to the amount of responsibility you take in life. The more responsibility you take in life, the more meaningful your life is going to feel. And this is how he breaks it down. It's fucking so good. So we have to first take responsibility for ourselves. We have to make our bed. We have to take care of our health. Um, we have to do things that are going to lead to us just being safe and healthy and happy, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not enough. We, In order for us to have the best life possible, we also have to treat, uh, we also have to take responsibility for others because the way that we treat others will dictate how we are then treated. And so if we are selfish, self-centered and don't take responsibility for others' well-being, then they're going to they are going to make our lives um, less enjoyable and it's going to it's going to take away from us having uh, the, the ideal life, mm-hmm. right? So we have to take care of ourselves in the present. We also have to take care of others in the present. But that's not enough because we also like what what is best for me right now? is not necessarily the best for future me. Mm -hmm. It's not the best for me in a week, the best for me in a year, et cetera. So just eating pizza might be the the best thing for me right in this moment, but it's not the best for me tomorrow when I wake up and I have, you know, I'm a little sensitive to gluten or something like that or dairy and I wake up and have a shitty day. So he says, we also have to take responsibility for ourselves in the future, whether Mm -hmm. that be a week, a year, 10 years. But that's not enough. And this is the last one and I'm done. That's not enough. We also have to take responsibility for others in the future because the way like the the amount of responsibility we take for others in the future has an impact on our lives in the future. So every decision that we make in the present 
has to take all four of those into account. We have to take care of ourselves and others in the present and our future selves and other people, people's future selves in the present. So most people are stuck maybe in that first quadrant. A, maybe a little bit in the second as well. Right. But the more that we can make decisions out of what is the best for me and other people now and in the future just makes life meaningful. Man, that's awesome. I I, I need to look at that or I need to like see him talking about that. I haven't read his book yet, but I want to. But the thing that I'm thinking is fascinating about it, that idea now is like you can kind of put it into a box where you could, you know, and I know you can't do this very simply, but I'm just thinking how you can almost stratify people, you know, like for instance, um, stratify people by their outlooks on life and people that kind of end up going towards one fringe or another through confirmation bias and all this kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so to me and nothing against your people, Mike, but like the millennial generation, the thing that makes me roll, (laughs) the thing that makes me roll my eyes um, is like this whole not being prepared for the future thing. Like, okay, yes, you went into $150,000 on student debt on something that you had to have known was not going to pay you well. You can't, you know what I mean? And and that sort of thing. And that's obviously painting with a broad brush, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, so that's two two quadrants or at least, you know, one of the quadrants of, of that that idea is saying that you weren't thinking about future me. You were thinking about mm-hmm. present me and this is fulfilling me in the present and you weren't filtering that through that. And then you got other people that are on the whole other end and I'm pretty libertarian, but then like the complete libertarian people like the whole Anne, Anne Rand or however you say her name, Atlas Shrugged. Anne Rand. Anne, yeah. Anne Rand. I never knew how to say it. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, which is like the virtue of selfishness, right? But, and, and I agree with a lot of the stuff about the the self-reliance and the, um, the uh, you know, libertarianism of, of being able to, uh, you know, fend for yourself and from that then. But I do not think it's a good thing to be selfish. I think if you go all in on that philosophy, I think most people are going to be woefully unhappy. And if the whole world lived like that, the whole world would definitely be woefully unhappy Mm -hmm. right and so that takes away those two quadrants of thinking about others as well right so you think so that's a yeah that's really interesting man i I like that a lot i need to look that up okay should we talk about some gymnastics Uh, yeah man let's do it so i got a handful of questions out of tim ferris's book tools of titans that i really like um, that help dissect different physical disciplines and the first one's super simple so what are the key principles and we're talking about gymnastics in the sport of fitness as opposed to artistic gymnastics what are the key principles novices should learn so yeah so i absolutely love how you frame that because that's where i think my strength lies is in gymnastics for the sport of fitness and so that's how we frame everything so um the the what I think is we have we have a tiered system that has worked very well for us now for what five years, mm-hmm. um, and um, and that tiered system separates everything into three main categories. So I said if we had to have a starting point, we would start with the main categories, and so those three main categories are um, strength, skill, and then endurance. Now for me, whenever I'm training athletes. I'm not in a lot of ways training them directly for endurance, right? But if you're going to be in the sport of fitness, you have to keep in mind that at all times because you can't just train your strength and um, uh, and your skill and leave that on on the back burner, you know, especially if you want to be a highly competent, you're a high level athlete, which is something that in brute we have to think about a lot. You know, I remember... um, Yeah, a lot of instances with our higher level athletes, you're, you know, they're asking me, Nick, should I be doing my basics and stuff like that? And the answer is usually yes. But for a lot of them at certain points in their, uh, you know, in the in the season, the answer is no. You know, you Mm -hmm. have to be focused on endurance. So um, but then we also break up the, uh, you know, the skill into different aspects, which is um, static holds and then skill elements, which is going. So basically being able to recreate body positions and then going in between the body positions. And then the strength is you, the main principle I would tell you is with the strength is sometimes you just have to get stronger. Don't be aware that you have to be able to push, you have to be able to pull, and you have to have core strength to motor this other skill stuff. Like don't go seek out the guy that's gonna give you the drill that's gonna get you the muscle up. Be aware Mm -hmm. of whether or not you have the capacity to do that, just if you have the motor. You know, uh, it, so you need the, you need fuel for the engine. You know, that car's not going anywhere 
if you don't have fuel in it. And that car's not going anywhere if it doesn't have a motor, right? But then once that that motor has fuel, you have a motor and that motor has fuel, so you've got the endurance and you've got the strength, then, you know, we can make sure those gears are aligned, right? Which is which is the skill, you know, and make sure those gears are, gears are getting from one position to the other. So when you say strength, are you talking about like if you, if you want to be able to do handstand push-ups to spend time doing strict press or something else? How how does one most efficiently develop strength in a way that correlates to gymnastics? Yeah, I think in most instances, um, it's pretty logical um, for, uh, but with some nuances. So like with, um, we all know the guy that can strict press a lot, but can't do a handstand push-up right? Like you've all yep. seen that guy in the gym. Uh, and that's because a handstand pushup does take some amount of skill. Um, it, it, because it has to do with the rotation of your scapula, like your body hat. And it also has to do with you placing your center of gravity in the right position. So the same way, you know, there is a skill to doing a strict press and that skill, the first thing they teach you is to pull your head back, right? So that you can push the weight above your feet, which is your base of support, which essentially keeps the center of mass that you're moving over your base of support. So you pull your head back and then you press, right? So that is a skill, a very low level skill, but it is a skill. And then, um, you know, there's other things they teach you about the proper ergonomic placement of your elbows and things like that. And the thing that Matt Bruce always says, we don't squeeze on the bar. And so there's a skill to that. In the same way, there's also a skill to be inverted and pressing, right? There is a certain way that you can position your back and move your center of mass, which most athletes kind of figure out on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of guys, they kind of figured it out the same way. If I, you didn't have to listen to a podcast on a strict press or go to a level one cert to learn how to press. We're smart people. And as, as humans and our body figures out what was incorrect and what was correct about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that, that what could take us all the way back to talking about the basics and why the basics are important. Cause you're tend to be more prepared if you train body positions to recognize those efficiencies and inefficiencies and replic and replicate what works and avoid what didn't if you if you do the basics but um so that's that you know that's the little piece about handstand push-ups and you can do that by um you know box handstand push-ups are my favorite thing you know um doing a handstand push-up on a box uh and you can also use a spotter that's one thing we don't do enough you can have people who physically lift you through the movement um and there's other little drills that we do you know for dips is another example I, and one thing is you know in in, um, you know, competitive fitness, CrossFit, everybody's like, well, ring dips, that's the end goal. You know, that's not really the end goal unless you want to compete in CrossFit. The end goal is being able to do upright pushing, right? And then the rings just add a different variable to that. So mm -hmm. you don't have to just do ring dips. You can get you some very rigid supports and press on that and it's going to be easier, right? Uh, and be help you load the movement more because you can physically do more because it takes the way of the variable of the, um, the support swaying and making it harder. Um, and you know, another example uh, is like, uh, rings, uh, pull-ups. If you want to get a muscle up, you don't have to just do pull-ups on a bar right? You actually, if you do a pull up on the rings, it takes a different set of muscles than a pull up on the bar because the rings sway. So, you know, that's a long way of saying that it, it depends on what you want to do, but you can vary. I think what people don't tend to do or, or have a tendency not to do is to not think logically about the why they're doing something. They mm -hmm. just want to do the thing that, that, like everybody else is doing that. So I should be doing that or find the next gimmick that's going to get them there faster. But it's pretty illogical of just saying, well, if I want to be able to do a muscle up, which involves pulling from a support that sways, then I should be doing, I should do a lot of pull ups from something that sways, which includes a rope and rings, ring rows and stuff like that. So it's safe to say that you want to mimic the actual movement as closely as possible. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, pretty much all the examples I used were, were, were that, you know, it's right. Yeah. And you can pretty, you can pretty logically do that and everything else beyond that, like, okay, say so take push ups because everybody's got a million types of plyo push ups and stuff like that. Everything else beyond mimicking the movement and doing it for the right reason, being in the right position with the right apparatus, everything else beyond that is for variety. That's for your own head to keep you more involved in it. You know, doing push ups where you swing your arms out from side to side, that's cool. But the reality is like you get diminishing returns on saying that's going to get me the exact right muscle groups that I need mm -hmm. to do the skill. What that does is it makes you more engaged in it because that's fun, right? Right. But let's be clear about what that purpose is, right? Yeah, exactly. So Rather than thinking it, it 
directly correlates. Yeah. So I'm doing today. My purpose is to do prone pushing because prone pushing is important for the sport of fitness, right? So I mean, that's push-ups. Now, if I want to do it on the rings or if I want to do it where my arm goes out to the side and flies, or I put something on my back or I, you know, I'm chasing a chicken around on my hands, whatever, then that is just for variety. You know, the first thing, and that, I guess it's kind of the same thing that you mentioned before, like passing things through filters. The first filter that I pass it through is why am I doing it? And then everything mm-hmm. else is, you know, the, you know, sky's the limit, have fun with it. So I noticed in your, in your, in your first two things, you said we need to focus on strength and skill. I noticed that endurance is not a piece of that. Why? Oh yeah. Well, okay. So for us, that's a good question. For us, the main reason is that if you are doing the sport of fitness, you are getting plenty of endurance in other things, right? Like you are doing the wads. Um, if you're, you're doing all this stuff that, um, everybody, Nick Fowler and everybody, Adrian and everybody programs, right? So for me, it's the easy answer to that because that's already built in Mm -hmm. to, to our system, but I do not feel comfortable if I'm writing a program or if I'm, I'm making a philosophy for how I'm going to program and leaving that out. Like, I'm not going to leave it out because I have to, even though I'm not doing it, and this is what I say in all my talks, even though I'm allowing somebody else to do that, I still have that main bullet point right there. Because, mm-hmm. you know, um, that's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't, I'm, I thought I was going to come up with a clever analogy there, <laughs> but, but, uh, my mind's going blank, but essentially like, it's such an important thing to your whole body as a machine, like that recognizing that thing needs fuel that it's, so if I were to go out and, and with our, and even with our gymnastics only program, like we tell people like, this is for mainly for your, you know, your strength and your skill. But if you want to be successful in the sport of fitness, you need to have, um, you know, an endurance piece as well. Now, for local muscle endurance, you know, whenever we're writing um, specific progressions, we do take in some of those philosophies that, you know, uh, and I've learned a lot of this from guys like Henshaw and Fowler and them on how to do adaptive training, you know, using intensity and volume cycles um, to 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 uh, most effectively increase our local muscle endurance, which is mm-hmm. what I'm mainly dealing with that I want to do a lot of pull-ups, right? Or I want to be able to do a lot of muscle-ups before my arms give out. But, you know, the specific training that we do, and it doesn't mean that you can do a lot of muscle-ups plus a lot of rowing plus a lot of, because that's going to be your whole VO2 max and all of the other limiting factors, as well as the fascinating aspect of what you deal with, which is uh, which one of your things is the um, the mental aspect, right? Like, mm-hmm. and if you read a lot of these guys that are ultra marathoners, they talk about the the mental aspect of it, right? And the mental aspect. So I actually, when I talk about endurance, you know, in under that umbrella, endurance is also the mental aspect of it. Like, what are you willing? Because your body's not going to die, right? You're just your body's telling you that it wants to die and you need to stop. But the reality right. is, for most of the time, you could keep going. Right. And, and so there's a whole bunch of other areas to being successful in fitness that fall up under that umbrella that even though I'm working with you on strength and skill, we have to always keep that in our mind that if you really want to be successful in competitive fitness, that's important too. Right. right. Just you doing like, uh, you know, me, me giving you good muscle up tricks, right. And making your muscle ups a little bit more efficient isn't going to mean that you're going to go and win the muscle up wad at regionals or, or, or what used to be regional, the games or wad right. or whatever. Right. You have to focus on these other things as well. I do. I do fully agree with leaving endurance out of the initial conversation, though, especially with uh, especially when we're talking about things with such a high level of te- technical difficulty, um, you know, a muscle up, a handstand push up, handstand walking. All of those require so much attention to detail and technique that if you're like you should be focusing on just one perfect rep before you focus on doing five. Yeah, no, right? absolutely. Yeah, man. And actually, and that comes also into like the season too. So, and that's why I have guys that are way more, way smarter than me. Uh, it's easy to be smarter than me at that, <laughs> at like periodization and stuff, right? Like, mm-hmm. so Fowler, that was the first, actually, we were coming up with a, um, a way to like categorize and all of our exercises, everything we do, like can we archive these things like a Dewey decibel system for fitness? Mm-hmm. And the first, and I asked Fowler the, what's the first thing that you would think of? He says, what part of the season you were in? And that would have been the last thing 
that I would have thought of, right? I would have thought, okay, is it gymnastics, endurance, or, or, you know, that would have been my first filter. But his first filter is what part of the season you're in. And along with that, if you're the average competitive fitness person and you're not thinking about the season and what you're going to Wadapalooza or whatever it is, then you're thinking about what part in in my fitness career am I in? Am I at the part where I want to build skill or am I at the point where, because we only have a certain amount of hours in the day, Right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, or am I at the point where I am have my skill adequate enough to start working on the endurance aspect of it? But mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. You're not going to go and try to walk 100 yards on your hands before you can walk two yards correctly. Right. Exactly. You're not going to try to go. Well, you shouldn't try and go just get it done mm-hmm. because you're the anytime like the higher the higher the level of technique required for a certain skill, um, the more important this is that you create good movement patterns. Yeah. So there, you know, there's one one way to walk which is perfect, and you might only be be able to walk five yards. But a lot of people might be able to walk a hundred yards in ten minutes you know, looking like absolute dog shit, but it's going to be so much harder to repattern those, um, your central nervous system and to actually get that technique down. Yeah. So in the beginning, the more technical, the movement, the more important it is to do super low volume and just get perfect reps. Yeah. And, you, and you're going to, cause it's going to break down when you get tired. Like even if you yeah. have man, manageable reps for a couple reps in a row, if you haven't perfected the techniques and that's the other thing that I like to think about because people will, because they're dealing with relatively small amount of things, right? You have to be able to do a muscle up and a butterfly pull up and some handstand walking. It's not a lot of things, right? So you can master those without mastering basic movement patterns. But if you master the basic movement patterns, then those become reproducible. So for me, and that's why I like teaching people things in terms of like, okay, say for a butterfly pull up, I am rather than tell people to pop their hips or do their knees a certain way. I like to teach in terms of um, go from a hollow to an arch faster. And basically taking those movement patterns and if we know what a hollow feels like and you know what an arch feels like and you know what a straight arm pull down on the bar looks like and then you know what a bent arm pull into the bar feels like, then your body and you do those movement patterns over and over and over again, then you ha- it has a way of your body feels weird when it's not in that position. So you Mm -hmm. will notice it. So, and then that is something that doesn't, you don't really lose whenever you're tired. So whenever your body is breaking down, you still remember what that feels like. The same way you still remember what it feels like to standing upright on your feet. You tell Mm -hmm. yourself to get back up again. You know, you remember what it feels like to be in those different positions. And so that's kind of why I went into that philosophy on the way that I, on the way that I coach. This one might be another little tool for your, for your tool chest. Um, there's a guy, I think this is who said it. There's a, there's a coach in jujitsu named John Danaher. He, he's a very controversial coach, but he, he coached, uh, George St. Pierre. And he talks about the importance of defining positions as clearly as possible, because if you can clearly articulate in your head, what position you are in, what position, uh, they are in, then you, you can just see more of the options for yourself. And I think, I think what you're talking about is, is kind of similar. Like the more an athlete understands and has the language for what position they're in Mm -hmm. their, their, their options become more, uh, abundant, right? They see the different positions they can make with their body. What, well, you know, something like you have this, this thing in mu- with muscle ups where you teach people four or five different styles of muscle ups for different levels of fatigue or different right. ki- types of workouts. Once they have the language for those, those positions and those types of muscle ups, it just gives them more options yep. in workouts. Yeah. Then it's easy. Then all they are, it's the exact same thing. It's those exact same components. And just mixing and matching them. And Mm -hmm. the more you think about it, think of any any high-level sport in which those things don't exist. And baseball, whenever you're playing shortstop, you're in the ready position the exact same way every time, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever you're about to, whenever, you know, all the guys change their swings all the time, whenever they, whenever they're in a pattern of swinging a certain way, they always start in the same position and they can generally feel how well they swung by how they end up. Right. And so you're mm-hmm. going from one known position to another known position. And then the guts in between it 
happen more or less automatically, right? And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, football and basically anything, you we always start with these defined positions. And then because everything else happens so fast, like the dynamic portion in between it, you practice it. But then, you know, knowing and defining things in terms of known and reproducible positions is probably one of the most valuable things you can learn to do as a coach uh, and, an, and an athlete, I think. What are the biggest mistakes or myths you see in gymnastics training? And what are the biggest wastes of time? Uh, let's see. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I think we touched on one of them, which is like doing something for the sake of it being clever um, and like a clever drill because you saw it on Instagram and trying to, you know, clever your way into something rather than do the due diligence of uh, working your motor and working your skill, like making sure that you're comfortable and know that position and making sure you're strong enough to get in and out of it. Um, you know, that that's that's one of the biggest things. Um the uh i have, I have yeah. something to throw your way yeah on go ahead uh, at times people have given us some flack for using such a wide range of accessory movements when we're teaching yeah. something like the muscle up right and some people will just say if you want to do more muscle ups just do more muscle ups right, right? why like how does that relate to what you just said, which is not, I forget the word you use, but don't fancy it up. Yeah. Not, like we're using a lot of accessory way. movements, yeah. but we're not, how are we not fancying it up? Yeah. It's well, the, the main reason is because, um, because we're doing it for a reason, right? So, um, everything that we do is, is not, it's, if I would, if the accessories we'd be giving would be going through that filter of it just, of, of it just being clever, like, Hey, here's a clever muscle drill as filler then yes, that would be a 100% valid point. But the way that we do it is if I'm doing something, if I'm programming something for an athlete, it's because a part of the muscle up is being able to go from a straight arm hang to the top of a pull up, and then also being able to rock your center of gravity into a position where your shoulders go from behind the rings to in front of the rings. Those are two components. So the same way that you, know, you a part of a snatch is being able to go from mid thigh to the, you know, to the hip, and then to overhead, then snatching from blocks is a very valid training exercise in order to become more efficient at that. You know, you might as well say, why, why don't you just snatch more? Just do more snatches. Why are you doing all these quote unquote accessories? You can go overboard with the accessories. You know, you can have people doing, you know, uh, a skin the cats get a lot of flack because we were like, why do I need to learn how to do that? You know, there may be a time and a place for, for doing that stuff and we do include it. Uh, in our training program, but if we're doing it, it's mainly to work lever pulling. That's it. It's not because we want mm -hmm. people to be good at skin the cat. So if you don't have any reason why the coach is programming it, then it could, you could easily see that. But, you know, so one other example is a straight arm pull to invert, you know, so uh, you, you'll hear people say, well, how many pull-ups can you do whenever they, somebody's asking if they can do a bar muscle up? That's an absolute wrong question biomechanically because the bent arm pulling piece that you can't pull through the bar. You can't, so uh, the bent arm pulling is a much lesser component of a bar muscle up than straight arm pulling. So the question should be, can you grab, jump up to the bar and pull yourself upside down three to five times in a row? That's the better question. You know, mm -hmm. so you may look at somebody doing a tuck pull to invert and be like, that's a gymnastics move. No, it's not. We're doing it, well, it may be, but we're doing it in this instance because we're trying to work um, our straight arm pulling strength, right? Um, and and instead, you know, the other, so I guess that would lead me into the other thing that I saw. Um, and this is something that I promised myself I wouldn't do whenever um, I got the gig as a gymnastics coach for, for Brute. Is I promised myself I wouldn't just give people a cue or something without knowing why or knowing what it mm -hmm. meant. You know, and that goes to the all the any number of things that you hear and you regurgitate. Because we have this thing as coaches where we want to say something. Like we don't want an athlete to ask us a question and not have anything to give them back. So every time I want to be like, okay, no, head through the window. No, this time more uh, hip hop or, or whatever, any number of cues or you're broken at the midline or whatever that means, you know? And so, and so there's ar these, these arbitrary things that we throw out, but you can really make things make sense if you, with a very basic knowledge of physics and a very basic knowledge of ergonomics and human movement patterns, make things make sense in our physical world and just and then you 
you know, and then that can, you just look at the movement and say, what does not make sense from a functional standpoint, from a physics standpoint, and then what body positions can I get the person to get into in order to fix that problem? Love it. What are other mistakes, myths, or wastes of time? Uh, let's see. Cilantro. That's a waste Don't of you time. Say that. <laughs> Don't you say that? Uh, no, I love it, cilantro. I know. I hate, I'm one of those people that hate it. Um, uh, Does it taste like soap to yeah, you or something? Yes. Like? You're, I'm you're one, one of those people. Those guys. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I like to complain about it. Um, gotcha. <laughs> no, I don't know why. Um, some other ma- waste of time in gymnastics, uh, specifically for fitness. Um, man, I don't know. That's a tough one. I think I would have to narrow it narrow it down more because most of the things come under those those big umbrellas. You know mm-hmm. that that I think the things that we've already discussed. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not really sure. Anything else off the top of my head? That's okay. Yeah, we can find. You can't you can't know everything about everything. Right. <laughs> right. I'm a, I'm a work in progress, Mike. <laughs> uh. What are the most common? Let let let's let's get a little more specific here and let's talk about the muscle up. Mm-hmm. So, what are the common mistakes being made even at the professional level? Oh yeah. Okay. So that's a good one. So I mean, I've I've put posts about this, uh, a whole bunch, um, on, on the internet and stuff. And I don't know if it's a contentious point, but, um, about the whole pulling to the hips thing. So the, the thing is, is that at the elite level, um, guys will, uh, they pull the only way to pull the rings is in the direction that the straps are running. And when you're in a front swing, so your feet are in front of you and your shoulders are coming behind you, your feet are rotating backwards. You have to stop your backwards rotation and convert that to a forwards rotation. All right. So the only way to do that is to provide an equal and opposite for or equal force backwards. That's enough to convert that backwards angular momentum into a forward um, or upward force. So if you pull the rings directly to your hips, you're pulling the rings to your center of gravity. Um, and if something is uh, the point of resistance or the fulcrum is at the center of mass, no rotation can happen from a physics standpoint, period. So if you immediately pull your rings to your hips, you lose the tension on the rings and you you won't rotate. So, but what happens is people will see a very high level athlete pull really, really fast and really hard backwards, okay? But they don't see that part because it happens really fast. And then they come up and they catch the rings by their hips. They're like, that's what I gotta do. I wanna get those rings up by my hips. And so then it's perpetuated this thing where people say pull to the hips, but you know, a high level athlete or somebody that knows how to do a muscle up, they don't even realize they're doing it. And it happened with, um, I don't know if I know him well enough to put him on the spot here, but I guess I'll just say it. Noah Olson came down one time and, uh, he's a really nice guy. And, uh, he, he was showing me some of his muscle ups. He said the same thing. I've always been told pull to the hips. And then I videoed it and I showed him, I was like, look, this is where you pull backwards. He pulls backwards, but he does it because he's so strong, so hard and so fast that the rings then come forward and he catches them by his hip, by the hips. Um, so um, and the so that's something that uh, higher level athletes may come out like whenever they're fatigued. If that cue is in their head, they may miss reps because they think that's what they're doing. Right. But that's that's the wrong cue. Um, the other thing that I see higher level athletes doing is I think I want to muscle up. Um not uh, getting in a bad pushing position. So they'll tend to, uh, whenever they're pressing out of the dip, they tend to arch, which to me is not uh, as favorable of a pushing position. Um, that, uh, yeah, that's something that we worked in, uh, with, um, with uh, Brent Fikowski on. Brent, Brent's an awesome athlete, man. He's a really, really good dude. Um, and, he, and at first he was kind of like, why, why are we doing, you know, uh, but not saying questioning, but he was questioning because he's very intellectual, right? He's like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, I didn't realize that that would be an issue. And then we got him to where he would keep his body in a more hollow position while he's pressing. Um, and then he started feeling a lot better in his press out on the dips. Um, and so that's a very small detail that for a very, very fit guy doesn't play a role until you're extremely tired. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the you can imagine like if if you stole my lunch money, and I went up, imagine if I came to push you because I was mad because you stole my lunch money and I had like my shoulders slurred back. Imagine yourself just like looking like a, a you know, whatever, like a chicken sticking and then try to extend my arms as hard as I could and push you with my shoulders back. How I'm not going to be nearly as good as I am pushing if my shoulders are rolled forward. 
if the people can and that are listening to this can picture that right and so it's a yeah, strong I think people know forward and back yes well <laughs> i take i learned a lot of things in doctor school mike so i take for granted of what the you know the the lay person the fucking knows. doctor school <laughs> trump card <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, uh, but yeah. So but anyway, so you can imagine that's a better pushing position, but it's something that he didn't think of, and you know, a lot of people don't think of before. I think we did that mm -hmm. same thing with Allison Scuds. She was doing that a lot, and then she was failing some of hers when she was really tired. Some of her, um, uh, you know, some of her press outs, and we work on that. And so it's a yeah, it's a lot of uh, a lot of little things like that. If you only had, let's say, I couldn't do any muscle ups. Mm -hmm. If you only had six months to train me to get a muscle up, how would you train me? I would first, let's see, uh, I would have you make, I would make sure that you could hold, that, wait, swinging or, well. Swinging muscle, sw a ring muscle up. Just a swinging muscle up without a, yeah. yes. I still am in the camp of, you know, you should be able to do a strict muscle up first. All right, let's say we're just going to talk about swinging, the swinging muscle up. All right, let's take strict out of it. First thing I would have you do is be able to demonstrate a proper swing on the rings by far mm -hmm. a proper swing on the rings in which you can pull the rings back and apply the tension in the front swing. So if you can't do that and you do what everybody tends to do and you let the rings come forward, then you're just rotating backwards and you're doing a, a backflip and you can do that thing. Uh, uh, that, uh, like remember Jacob Hutton's first muscle up that he sent me where he picked his knees up. We, we got on a text chain about this. I don't other know. Day. It was I a long time ago. Was... He like, he kicked his knees way up in the air and then uh -huh. he was like, flipped tried to flip all the way forward and it was mm -hmm. righteous and awesome um I, we had a laugh about that uh, about a year ago 40 pounds of beef yeah oh but he, i mean he made it because he's friggin', he's like he could have pulled the rings out the ceiling <laughs> right uh but yeah that uh popped up in my news feed the other day so we were talking about that um but yeah so i would have them demonstrate a proper ring swing uh and i would make sure that they that plus make sure that they had the strength capacity to be able to do a muscle up so you know, I, I think it's like eight to 10 strict pull-ups and eight to 10 strict dips is pretty good numbers for a guy mm -hmm. or, or a girl, um, to be able to do it. Um, and then after that, um, the next tier would be able to demonstrate the proper positions, you know, bottom of the dip, um, uh, you know, um, ring support, top of the pull-up and as well as start to work on drills from getting between those positions, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, so it would kind of be a tiered thing, which plug our new muscle up program that we're coming out with that we'll be launching hopefully soon uh, has all those things. It's uh, five different programs. It takes you all the way from not being able to do a muscle up at all to building the strength to do the muscle up, then building the skill to do the muscle up, then advanced techniques, then elite capacity and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that'll be available soon. It's at brutestrengthtraining.com backslash muscle up. Imagine that. Imagine that. Does that answer your question? I don't even remember the original question now. It was, if you only had six months yeah. to get me a muscle up, how would you train me? So is that the last, is that the last step The drills to teach me how to go from position to position? Yeah. And then, uh, after that, uh, after that, then the last step would be, I would do, um, a lot of spotter assisted muscle ups to me. That's the best one. We, that's how we did it when we were kids, honestly, mm -hmm. like you, okay, really, so we didn't have a swinging muscle up, right? It was all strict muscle up. So essentially right. um, you, which is hard because in a CrossFit gym, you don't always have a, uh, you know, a spotter or somebody that can capable mm -hmm. of doing that. But when you're a kid in gymnastics, you always do, you always have a coach. And then we do a bunch of push-ups and pull-ups uh, and dips and all that stuff. Okay. You're pretty strong. Great. I can grab you by your, your hips and we're going to put you through this until you do it on your own. The next thing you know, mm -hmm. you're doing it on your own. Right. What, how, what would be different if I could do 20 muscle or 15 muscle ups and I wanted you to get me to 20, Ooh. what would be the, the difference in approach? Uh, okay. So getting from, all right, that's a man, that's an awesome question in my experience. So this is probably where I used to go wrong. I used to think that going from 15 to 20 to 25 was a skill thing. I don't think so. Um, I think, I think it's partly a skill thing, but I think it's probably weighted more heavily on just capacity training. I really do. Um, yeah. cause I think I have pretty good muscle up skill right now and I'd be hard pressed to get up there and do 12 to 15 just cause I'm not working out that much anymore. Right. I just, I would need more capacity. I'm not going to, I am not going to skill my way into doing, you know, 20 muscle ups. Right. Um, but I think a lot of people that, that will flip for whenever they're trying to go from five to 10 to maybe five to 15 or something like that to where that they'll get bigger dividends on the skill training. 
But those guys that are trying to get from those 15 numbers up to that 25 or whatever, that's just basically focusing on a capacity program. And I have a bunch of things that I can do, um, you know, a bunch of drills that we use. It's a lot of it's just doing muscle ups at that point, you know, and doing muscle ups in ways in which you can over like fatigue your like, you know, we'll pair muscle ups and GHD setups so that you're over, you know, you're straining your core, you know, and uh, and overloading that. And it's basically ways of overloading your your body through those intensity and volume cycles in order to get your muscle endurance where it needs to be to get it. Love it, man. So the level system that you built at Brute is designed such that people, so it's a 20 level, 20 level system and people can't progress before they've mastered every single component of the level. Yeah. So why is it, why is it built that way? And then how do you think this applies to being successful in any area of life? The same principle. Yeah. Um, cause it's, it's just, it's rational. You know what I mean? It's, it's rational that you wouldn't want to do. All right. So just take a very specific example. You don't, before you slam your whole weight on your cervical spine doing a handstand push-up, you'd like to be able to think that you could do a headstand, right? And so it's, you know, a logical progression and it helps us avoid it, it, it go, to go back to your previous thing we talked about, it makes you think about future me, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. present me wants to do a handstand push-up right now because it's awesome and everybody in the class is doing it and I want to do it in that workout. That's great. But what future you wants is it wants to be very, very efficient at that uh, and very proficient. I actually have a personal example of this. Whenever I was in gymnastics when I was younger, me and the guy who's my best friend growing up, we used, he used to, I used to always learn stuff faster than him. And I was like, ah, because basically because I was fearless, right? And I would mm -hmm. just do anything, you know, flip off the side of the bars and do whatever. And I would felt like that was awesome. But inevitably, I would always and then get like a hiccup and to where I would like start to struggle with it. And then he would just surpass me mm -hmm. always, you know, and I, th I think it was just a different philosophy where he like made sure he got everything the coach said exactly right before he went for it and everything. And then his mastery of it was greater than my mastery of it. The same way Michael Jordan's mastery of the game was better than uh, other people because he mastered the basics. You know, he mastered right. how to dribble and how to shoot and how to make things reproducible and do it every time, all the time. Uh, and, right. you, you know, you'd be hard pressed to look at any person that was it, or basically not hard pressed. You will see that everywhere. If you just look right. up quotes of people that were masters at their craft, it is just apparent and plain in human existence that that is, um, you know, you don't, that's one of the things that you don't need a research study to show. It's apparent and plain in our common human history. Dial in the fundamentals. So let's start to wrap this up, man. Um, I have a couple questions for you about parenthood. Yeah, go for it. Here. Go for it, man. It's so it's funny that you said that because I just heard my kids uh, uh, yelling in the background. So I was thinking nice. about parenthood. Uh, so you're a dad of two girls now. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What what strengths of yours have made you a good dad so far? Oh, uh, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, I like to think I'm a good dad. Um, I didn't say you were a good. Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do I think I'm a good dad? Yeah. Yes. I, dude, I've got, I got a mug and uh, a couple of cards and, you know, so I, I think that pretty yeah. much proves it. A t-shirt. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I have this conversation a lot with people. Um, I think you can screw up. Um, uh, I think I, I think I, I love, love my kids uh, a lot. And, um, but I think even if you love your kids a lot, you can still screw it up um, in terms of, What's important to me is that they grow up to be happy people, you know, and I'll tell my daughter this even at a young age, even though she doesn't understand it, but I'll tell her like, you know, baby, I want you to be happy, but daddy needs to make sure that you grow up to be a happy person. And you know, that you, you know, and, and essentially what I'm thinking that I can't tell a three-year-old is that, that uh, I instill in her those virtues and those qualities mm -hmm. that are going to make her happy in the long run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess it goes back to, again, to those things that you were talking about, like the thinking about the future her and the, the future me and, and think, mm -hmm. putting all those things. So, um, you know, I think you have to have, uh, so it's, and then 
I think about this a lot too, about emotion and, uh, and reason. So I think about emotion as being the motivating factor or, or, you know, that gets you like that emotion to say, take away parenthood and just think training that emotion of saying, I want to be the best and I want to get out. And that's, what's going to get me to the gym today. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you also have to have your reason, which is why you do it. And that reason for whenever it's a bad day, that reasoning tells you, okay, even though I don't feel like doing it, my mind is telling me that my emotions are lying to me. My mind is telling me that even though I don't feel like getting up and doing this, what's important to me is, is achieving this goal. And, you know, um, and, and so with parenthood, it's a, it's a lot similar. So my emotions are my motivation. Like I'm motivated because I love my kids because parenting is mm -hmm. hard, but my reasoning is gets me from the, through the times when my emotions don't line up with that. Right. So either my emotions tell me that I don't like my kid right now because he's being a little turd. Right. Mm -hmm. Or my emotion tells me that I love my kid too, that, that I want to take it easy on my kid because I love her and mm -hmm. I just want her to be happy in this moment. Right. So that's whenever those emotions, either whether it be on either end of the spectrum, like either I want to feel more badly about them than I should for their good or or better about them than I should for their good, that that corrals me back into the reasoning that the most important thing is that I make sure they're happy and healthy and grow up to be good people. Love that, man. Are there any traits or behaviors that you have that you think have been obstacles uh, for you in parenthood? Um. I'm impatient. <laughs> um, yeah. I, oh, and I'd say the biggest one, honestly, is, well, yeah, is that I had a hard time and I still do. And I'm working on compartmentalizing things that, yes, that has to be the biggest one. Um, and actually, you know, I, I learned a lot of that through just my dealing with people in, in brute. That's one. And because you guys have been a part of my formative years and being a parent because I've, I've been with brood ever since I've been a parent, but mm -hmm. learning the, because all of you guys have the same thing, learning how to compartmentalize the different things in your life. And I was bad at that. I would get home and I would be, even though I'm with my kids, I'm not present, right. Where I'm distracted yeah. thinking about the next thing that I need to do. And, um, you know, I've, I remember a conversation I've had with you and multiple people in brood and other friends where I just learned that, that, that was, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I thought that was me being productive and I thought that was me being a good person and, and doing all these things, but I learned it was making me unhappy. It just right. being distracted. And so I started to compartmentalize my life where when I, if I don't, when I get home, I get home. And in, unless it's a rare occasion, I try to just be focused on my kids and be present with my kids. Um, but it's still a struggle. Uh, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get in bad habits where I'll do that or with my wife where I don't give her the attention that she deserves and things like right. that. So. Has there been anything like any strategy that you've implemented that's most helped this? Uh, really, it um, uh, the first thing would be be aware of it, you know, which is what mm -hmm. I mentioned before mm -hmm. about the cell phone thing. Like when I feel myself being want, wanting to get distracted, being mindful of why, like right. why is why is that? Why do I not? Why do I feel the need to look at my phone instead of play with my kids in the bathtub? All right, mm -hmm. or and and then two is to put up. Uh, basic, basic, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like day planning skills, right? Mm -hmm. Day planning skills. Like right? I'm going to work when I'm at work and when I get home, I'm going to be home, you know? And even though it's still hard and I'm working on it, you know, it's, I'm, uh, those are, those are the two things that have helped me a lot. That's huge, man. Yeah. And really putting, I, I find putting boundaries for myself around technology is, as silly as it seems, just having rules like no phones in the bedroom, no phones at the table ever, um, they just allow me to be present in those moments, right? Rather than just leaving it up to my willpower or leaving it to be like a decision that I have to make over and over and over and over. I just make the decision once and then I never have to deal with it. Yeah, I like that a lot. And that's what that guy talked about in the um, perfect day formula. That mm -hmm. one thing that stuck out with me was the example he gave about rules. And people were like, why would you have a rule that's that's limiting? But the reality is, all right, say if you're pregnant, you would have a rule that you do not drink when you're pregnant, right? And that's right. a non-negotiable right. rule. That was one of the examples he used. But because we, we all have non-negotiable rules all the time, it is a non-negotiable rule that I do not steal. You know, so why can I not have another non-negotiable rule that I 
through my reasoning says is good for my life. No matter what my right. emotions tell me at the time, my reasoning says that this is good for my life. Um, I haven't been as good as I want to be at implementing those rules, but I 100% get the value of them. Well, sweet brother. This has been great. Um, I want to make everybody aware one more time. We do have this awesome new book that Nick created. It's called the muscle up book. <laughs> I guess I don't know. It has a picture of Mike with his is. shirt off on the front. So I think it is actually. So you'll get that included. Um, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about this book. Um, so it's, uh, it basically takes what I was saying before. Um, it takes you from the basics of not knowing anything about a muscle up. Like you could have never walked into a gym before, uh, and you can start and it would take you on the path where you go through step one, where you basically start building the strength to, to get to the point to where you can then start working on the skill as we kind of alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, this is whenever you, you phrase a question earlier was saying, doing a swinging muscle up first, which implies kind of somebody that's already been in a gym for a while and already has some capacity and strength. So mm -hmm. for this book, we're taking it from the step of step one is as if you've never walked into a gym before. Right. So for that, we're starting off with the strength. We're building a motor before we put a car around it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then um, then the next step would be um, skill. So you start to work on the different skill elements that would get you towards getting an actual strict muscle up. Now, this is all it doesn't mean that you have to go in this. You know, if you buy the book, you can use it. You may be at a different level. And we have some suggestions in there for who can use who how you can use it for your particular training program. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and so, cause the next step is a swinging muscle up. So that's the swinging skill. Then the next step would be, um, advanced techniques. So, you know, you can see how you kind of work your way from somebody that's been in the gym, never been in the gym to somebody that's been in the gym for a little while, but you know, wants to work on the skill to somebody that's already competitive and wants to be more competitive. And then the very last step is the elite capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that goes back to that piece we talk about of really training that volume and intensity. Uh, and then throughout all that, there's uh, visual guides, videos, um, general hilarity, um, action mm -hmm. and adventure and, uh, all kinds of stuff. But no, it's, it's, uh, it, there's pearls and pitfalls that tell you about common techniques that will show you on mm -hmm. pictures. Some of the things that we mentioned about, um, you know, the muscle ups and, and like I said, I try to make sure that everything in there is, is a why, you know, there's that there, you can see that the rationale behind it is clear and apparent. And I think even if you're a coach, it would make you a better coach. Like I think, without a doubt, it, without a doubt. I think if you just by reading through that, It'll help you in those moments where your athlete asks you, like, what am I doing wrong? And it will help you either wisely not say anything and be like, you just need more time. Okay. Cause vitamin T is a good um, prescription a lot of times. Sometimes you just need more time. You don't have to change something every time. Um, or whether or not there's an actionable thing that you can reason into, you know, telling them to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I love about it is that you teach very high level principles. So if, if a coach reads this book, they'll understand high level principles about muscle ups, but they'll then immediately be able to apply that to different mo movement patterns. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's just a great general source of educate, like gymnastics education for people as well. You can get that at brute strength training.com backslash muscle up. Nick, where mm -hmm. can they find you and keep up with you personally, man? Uh, I do, uh, my Instagram is the main conduit for my, uh, you know, I, I post stuff on there from, uh, it's a uh, coach Nick Sorrell. Uh, I think that's my handle, right? Two so, R's, two L's. No, uh, two R's, one L. One L. Yeah. It's a yeah, running joke with all my friends that I get aggravated that put, people put two L's on my names. So that's how it is on like all the wedding programs that I'm on and everything. Right? Amazing. Yeah. My friends, Amazing. My friends are awesome. Uh, and then, uh, and then other than that through brute, you know, what I tell people is, you know, I don't. I love doing what I do because I do it with brute, right? If brute ceased to exist, I'm, I'm probably wouldn't do it, but mainly just because it like I enjoy doing this with those people. So, you know, if you want to get with me and get coaching and stuff like that, you know, uh, brute street training.com. That's the way to find me. Hell yeah, man. Thank you so much for your time, Nick. Got it. Love you. Hey, if you're interested in getting better at gymnastics, you want to, get your first pull up. You want to get more pull ups. You want to get your first muscle up. You want to do more muscle ups. You just want to get better at gymnastics. We have an awesome video series for you. So 
our gymnastics doctor, Nick Sorrell, created a three-part video series where he covers program design. So the first video is on program design, and this is how we program for our athletes. And, th- and he teaches it in a way that makes it immediately useful to you in getting better at gymnastics. He goes over what he calls the big eight. So these are the highest yield exercises that if you do nothing else with your gymnastics skill sessions, if you do these eight, this will get you the majority of the results that you're looking for. And finally, he did, he goes over something he calls the capacity formula. And this is a way to assess yourself and find your weak points, your, your biggest weaknesses in your gymnastics skill level. And he talks about how to use that information in a way that can help you grow and improve your skills and capacity in gymnastics as quickly as possible. And this is a free video series that we offer and you can get access to it by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash GSL brutestrengthtraining.com backslash GSL. So it's a three-part video series. He covers program design, the big eight, and the capacity formula. Hope you enjoy. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to brutestrengthtraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's brutestrengthtraining.com slash SSW. 